So once a year or so, this map of high-speed rail in the United States goes viral. Somebody tweets it out, and then a bunch of urbanists and transportation wonks go crazy. It's like clockwork. You know, our new transportation secretary, uh, Mayor Pete, tweets it out. Gen Z is dreaming big. It's time we all did the same. Yeah, okay. But, you know, you really look at the map, and some of it makes sense, and some of it is like... I don't know. I mean, do we really need a high-speed rail corridor between Kansas City and Oklahoma City, Denver and Albuquerque, Sacramento, and I don't even know where this is going. Eugene, Portland, Seattle. So welcome to City Nerd. I'm your host, Ray. Um, I hope you guys are all doing well. So it actually makes for a successful high-speed rail. Do you want to make back its operating costs, construction costs? Do you have other ambitions, can you justify it by climate benefits, environmental, economic development, tourism? There are definitely high-speed rail lines out there, some of the legacy ones that have turned to profit, that have made their money back. So that, at least that's like a good starting point for talking about whether it's worth it to build these or not. And so you look at Tokyo to Osaka line, obviously connects two enormous cities, 250 miles apart, made its money back pretty quickly. But then even something like Paris to Lyon, which is about 240 miles. You know, Paris is a 10, 10, 11 million. Lyon's not that big. If Lyon is about the size of, I don't know, Portland or Cincinnati, a couple million, right? But that's a successful line. Um, they did pretty well in construction costs able to make their money back. And so something like that can work as well. So, but the point is you want to connect to large-ish population centers and, you know, you don't want them to be too close together and you don't want them to be too far apart. It's kind of a Goldilocks problem, right? If, if the cities are too close together, then high-speed rail is not going to be very competitive with driving or even taking like the local train. You're just not going to get that much more benefit by having a high-speed rail line. If they're too far apart, you're just not gonna be able to compete with the plane if you're 700, 800 miles apart. It's just gonna be faster to take the plane there. So to analyze and kind of make sense of what is gonna work in the US and where we should prioritize, there's really, there's really two pieces to the analysis. One is, what's the overall travel demand between two cities? And then the other piece of the analysis is how competitive is high-speed rail versus the car for shorter distances and how competitive is it against an airplane for longer distances. Before I get to kind of those two pieces of the analysis, a little bit about assumptions. So to determine the size of the cities, I used the combined statistical area, which is more inclusive than the metropolitan area that you often see. So a combined statistical area, depending on the proximity of cities, it may combine two metropolitan areas that, that kind of run together. And so examples would be DC and Baltimore become a single combined statistical area, San Francisco and San Jose, Boston and Providence. So as far as looking at high-speed rail, you're kind of counting that whole population shed, which I think makes sense since you know, if you're doing high-speed rail to Boston, yeah, you're probably gonna have a Providence stop anyway. The only other piece was I kept it within the United States. I just didn't want to assume that it would be straightforward to extend a line across uh, an international border. So it kind of comes into play in two ways. I mean, number one, for the CSAs, there, there are certain cities like San Diego, and El Paso, for example, that would become quite a bit larger metropolitan areas if you included Tijuana and Juarez. I didn't do that. I just didn't want to assume it would be that straightforward um, to deal with the, the international borders. Um, and then the other piece is I didn't want to assume lines that extended over the border. So like Seattle to Vancouver, BC, San Antonio to Monterrey, Mexico would be kind of an interesting pair. And for that matter, you know, Mexico City to Guadalajara uh, would be entirely external to the U.S. Um, it's probably a pretty strong pair. I didn't analyze it, though. And Canadian cities as well. There, there are lots of ways to connect to Montreal and Toronto that might make sense as well. So step one is what we call a gravity model. So it takes two cities and their distance to kind of give an estimate of the relative weight of travel demand between the two cities. At its simplest, it's population of the first area multiplied by population of the second area, and then all that divided by the distance squared. This is a really basic 
gravity that you use in things like travel demand modeling. So there are lots of ways to kind of calibrate it to, to conditions. But just for this exercise, I, I just kept it simple. If you want to read um, a lot more interesting research, go to um, Elon Levy's blog. They have um, some great posts that explain how the gravity model gets applied and what kinds of ridership projections are involved. Um, so I'll leave a link to that below. And then the second step is to apply a factor that accounts for how competitive high-speed rail is to driving or flying. The best way to explain this is a time and distance chart. And so start with the car. So if you think about with a car, and here are the upsides, you know, as much as you may or may not loathe car travel. You go out the door of your house, you get in your car and you get on the road and, and you're you're on your way, right? And so but you get this very straight line. So that's the car. And then the opposite end of the spectrum is airplane travel, where you have to find a way to access the airport, which is time consuming, probably, depending on where you are relative to your airport. Same thing on the other end, how close is the airport in the city you're going to, to the place you want to be. And then obviously the wait time at the airport is significant. And then the other piece is, you know, yeah, airplanes go 500 miles an hour, but they don't do that until they're done taxiing and taking off and getting into their flight plan and getting up to altitude. And that might not even happen on a really short flight. You might be up and down really quickly, so you never hit that max speed. Um, so, but the longer the flight is, the faster the average travel speed is. That's kind of what's reflected on this curve here. And then, so that leaves space for high-speed rail to, to compete. And so you get a little of, the, of both worlds. You've got some of the travel time to the station and the weight at the station that you get with planes, but it's quite a bit lower. The station is usually much more centrally located than an airport would be. And so that results in your getting your trip underway faster. The travel speed of the train obviously is faster, but not as fast as the airplane. So you get this effect where you've got kind of this triangle of competitiveness where the high speed rail comes in under the car first and it takes up until, I don't know, five or 600 miles out before the plane becomes a better option again. And so really the optimal distance is thought to be around 250 miles. It can vary obviously depending on how fast the train is and what the comparative options are. Keep in mind, this is generalized, right? There's all kinds of caveats you can have, you know, depending on your personal location relative to the airport. Um, how many people are traveling? If there's just one of you, then rail and the airplane do pretty well. If there's four of you going somewhere, it makes it a lot harder to compete with the car because the car is one fixed cost and it doesn't matter how many passengers you put in it. But if you get on a plane or a train, you just quadrupled um, the cost of it. The other thing, particularly with the train, is how much do you value the time inside the vehicle, or how much of a penalty is it, right, on the on the flip side? In a car, you have to drive the car, right, unless you're the passenger. You can't really multitask. You can listen to a podcast or something. On an airplane, there's a lot of waiting time. I don't know, you can fool around in your phone and check email, I guess. And then there's the time in the airplane, which is, not high quality. You can, you can get out your laptop and work or you, you can probably do something productive, but it's not great. And so this is where the rail just really beats everything. All right. So I ran the population and distance numbers through these calculations to try to figure out the relative potential for high-speed rail between all of these different city pairs. And so now I've got the top 10. We're going to go 10 through 1. Number 10, is Miami to Orlando. Um, so this one's interesting because they are in the process of building out the bright line. I believe it tops out at, I don't know, 120 miles an hour, which isn't like a super high speed. It's got at grade crossings, which isn't good. Like if you go take high speed rail in Europe or 
probably Japan, everything is grade separated, meaning that roads go over the top of it or underneath it. They don't go across, right? You just can't, you just can't access it at all. It's a safety issue and a reliability issue. So yeah, not, not like an optimized speed rail. Nine is Boston to Philadelphia. So this is the first entry of an existing Acela link on this list. Uh, and what you'll see is that several of the origin destination pairs kind of overlap along the Acela route, which is really what makes it so powerful, right? Um, you've got segments of track like New York to Philadelphia that serve several high demand origin destination pairs. Eight is Chicago to Detroit. And this is the only appearance on the list for Chicago, which is really, I don't know, interesting and kind of sad because historically Chicago has been kind of like the very hub of the entire national rail network, right? When you think about, you know, produce, livestock, passenger travel too. And, and then, you know, the other thing is it really is a world-class city, right? I mean, it's, it's the capital of the center of the country, you could, you could say. Um, so you would think that it would connect to a lot of interesting origin destination pairs for, um, for high-speed rail, but the numbers just don't really work out. I'm not saying it shouldn't all be built out eventually. It just, just not making the top of the list, but you can see, you can connect to Minneapolis, St. Louis, Indianapolis, Cleveland, Cincinnati, I don't know, all kinds of cities that are within 150 to 350 miles. They, they could make sense. They just, they just don't pencil out quite as well. Seven is Los Angeles to Las Vegas. You know, this is a line that would take a lot of planes out of the air, right? It would take a lot of planes out of the air, it would take a lot of cars off Interstate 15 or, I don't know, do we call it the 15? Eh. I'm not an LA guy. So even though like the gravity model doesn't rate it as highly, the fact that Las Vegas is such a big kind of tourist draw um, makes it maybe even more attractive. And, and so maybe it's underrated on my list. That would be my my guess. Six is Los Angeles up to the Bay Area. And it kind of shocks me to see that it's only number six. As much money and energy and controversy as has gone into trying to get this thing built. But it's just, just because of the distance between the cities, it's not as promising as you would have hoped it was. It's getting up towards 400 miles, which is not, you know, it's still competitive. It's just not at that optimal spot on the curve that would make it super useful um, and super attractive. You know, it would be good for taking some cars off I-5. It would be good for taking some planes out of the air. But again, I mean, the problem is if you're going from LA to San Francisco or the Bay Area, you think of, uh, I have to fly from LAX to SFO. Yeah, that would suck. But you can also fly out of Santa Ana. You can fly out of Long Beach, Burbank, Ontario. And then up in the Bay Area, you can fly into Oakland or San Jose. Those are super easy to fly into and out of. So. I don't know. And I'm a, I'm a train nerd. Um, I don't know. I would probably take it, but but I wouldn't expect the general public to get super excited um, unless it's really providing a travel time saving over the airplane. When we get to five. I, I wouldn't have thought Dallas to Houston would have rated above LA to San Francisco, but it does. The thing is, it is almost perfect. It really is. It's America's seventh and eighth largest cities. They are about 240 miles apart, which is almost perfect. And there's a lot of nothing in between, which should make it relatively easy to build. The problem with like the Salt Corridor, it's really hard to build anything new there. It's just the whole thing is pretty much urbanized and developed. Not so in Texas, although it is Texas. So I mean, my understanding is they're having a lot of issues, not not a surprise, they're having a lot of issues with, you know, landowners and eminent domain and surveying stuff and acquiring right away. But it's further along than you might think based on whatever your preconceptions might be about Texas politics. I guess the only problem with it is how do you extend it or leverage it? Probably makes sense to do like a Texas Triangle first, get Austin and San Antonio is kind of the third leg of that, that stool and build that whole thing up. But Dallas to Houston is by far like the most valuable piece of that. Four is Washington to Philadelphia. Spoiler alert, 
the top four are all in the Acela corridor. The reality is we should be just spending hundreds of billions of dollars on the, uh, the Acela corridor. It'll do way more to take planes out of the air and cars off the road than building that kind of project anywhere else. That's just, that's just how it is. I mean, if you think of Europe having a big high-speed rail network, um, well-developed, the eastern half of the United States could be like that. Three then is New York to Philadelphia. It's less than 100 miles. So it's really getting down to that end of the spectrum where it's not going to be as competitive with driving or even taking like a mega bus or, or something like that. And it kind of it kind of doesn't matter. You're going to be building this line regardless of the travel demand between New York and Philadelphia just because you need to get down to DC. And obviously you're gonna be stopping in Philadelphia. Number two is New York to Boston. Is it the North Atlantic Rail Project? There's been a plan on the books for a while because the, the travel time in this segment is not great by high speed rail standards. I mean, not even close. So there's an idea to put a tunnel under Long Island Sound and under parts of New York City. It's a slog getting from Penn Station up into Connecticut. They, they want to get the travel time down to, I think it's like 100 minutes, something like that. So interesting that that's on the books. Before I get to number one, which you can all probably guess anyway, and give honorable mentions. I went ahead and I analyzed city pairs in the US that rate better than Paris to Lyon, besides the top 10 on the list. One is Los Angeles to Phoenix, Chicago to Indianapolis would make that cut. And then the last one was Washington to Pittsburgh which seemed random to me, but I looked at it because I would think Philadelphia to Pittsburgh would make more sense. But if you look at a map, DC is actually closer to Pittsburgh. DC is closer to that optimal distance compared to Philadelphia. And also uh, Washington, Baltimore as a combined statistical area, is, it's, it's bigger than Philadelphia. And then finally, number one is New York to Washington. And it makes a lot of sense, right? It's our biggest city connecting to our political epicenter, uh, which is also a fairly large uh, metropolis in itself. I think this is backed up by the Amtrak data. I think that is actually the highest ridership pair um, on the Acela and the Northeast Corridor. I think they offered like a non-stop from Penn Station to Union Station. They got the travel time down to two and a half hours. And that is it. Uh, so give this a like, um, comment below. Uh, let me know if miss something? Is there a pair I didn't analyze that you thought would be on there? Where do you want to see high-speed rail? Um, let me know. Get some discussion going down in the comments. I'll be interested in seeing what you have to say. Um, and subscribe. <laughs>